Welcome, Andy. This is a long time coming. I have admired you and interacted with you for a while, but this is our first time talking live. So welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I would love to just backtrack to your you know, early years and how you got involved in wellness. You've had many, many years of being in the wellness community. Can you tell us a little bit about how you started off? Yeah, actually, yeah. I, um, like a lot of people, I was a, a field athlete. I tried to be a football soccer player and uh, didn't quite make it. Um, so then I, en I ended up going to do school in the UK and um, became a physical education teacher. So that's how I got got uh, into it. But I was always interested in sports and fitness and et cetera. But that, that's that's what I uh, that's what I started doing. Yeah. So what does a PE teacher or a physical education teacher mean in the UK? Because I know what it is here in America. Yeah, it's, it's the same. So, you know, we, we, we coach the kids through general exercise, through sports and obviously through my background in terms of soccer, you know, stroke football. I'm just clarifying that in case you've got some international guests. That yes, I know. Soccer footy. is football. Soccer not, is footy. Not football American. Yeah, I not know. It is pretty American. funny. It no, actually makes a enough. lot more sense. I don't think right? I'm tough enough for that. <laughs> well, I, as a Scottish person, isn't rugby really big? Yeah, no, I actually, I, I had to play that at university too. I played rugby um, as well. So yeah, I'm a massive fan of uh Master fan of rugby as well. So, so yeah, so no, physical education teacher, same thing. You coach the kids, you take them through and try and encourage them to lead a healthy and fit, you know, fit lifestyle, um, circuit training. Um, and actually one of the, one of the things I did on the back of that, I actually um, launched a company called Fit Kids. And would you believe it? We used to do kids exercise programs on hippity hot balls. Oh. Um, and we got on national TV in the UK. We back in the day, we had the old VHS videos. We sold thirty five thousand of those to kids, so all the kids at home could do these little dance routines on hippity hop balls. So yeah, I'm very, very proud of that. That was called Fit Kids back in the back in the day. And yeah, we got, we were on BBC national TV jumping around on hippity hop balls. And for those of you in the UK, I mean space hoppers. They're called space hoppers in the UK. So hippity hop are really large balls where you have large balls where they have the handles on them. Yes, yeah, like we had those in PE as you well. You imagine all the kids are you do have to have them like you think of it like a a big aerobics class. We at one point we had the largest ever hippity hop class at a place called Olympia in London. We had three and a half thousand kids all on these balls. We were up on the stage, three of us, and it was almost mesmerizing watching the kids with all the uh, with all the balls. So so yeah, so that was one of the things that I always wanted to try and do is look at, find new ways of encouraging kids to exercise, particularly the kids who are not into sport, which is why I know you're you're big into the sort of mind body, um, yoga, wellness, again same thing. Not that I was incredibly flexible, but I did try to encourage the kids to do it back in the day you'd call it a stretchy class, not really a yoga mind body class, but just to give them other things to try. And you know, I'm wondering what you think how kids are now in terms of fitness versus when you were doing this, which I'm sure was a couple decades ago. It was a little while ago. Yeah. yeah. So was, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, we talked about talking, your age. You're, so talking I know, but, yeah. you're talking in the 80s that and early 90s that I was doing that. So this was before, you know, the not, not the internet, but certainly phones and, and all these yeah, devices. There was, no, there was no online content, et cetera. We literally had to mail out VHS videos it was even before dvds and then we progressed to to uh to, to dvds um and then if you wanted anything you, you were lucky if you got a news item on the you know national tv you know that last the nice quaint story at the end of the news we were one of those so yeah that helped too that's wonderful so from there what did you do after after being a so yeah then then I, then I met um, a really interesting australian company who had a uh a a company called Fitness Professionals in the UK, which was um, back in the day, the only way to really promote exercise and fitness, you needed to own the publication, you needed to run the fitness conferences, you needed to do the workshops, which I know you go all over the world in doing workshops um, yourself. So we were the organization that would promote the large conferences. So here in the US, you've got things like URSA and IDEA, et cetera. So in the UK, Fitness Professionals was all of that in one. So we would run the big fitness conferences where personal trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, um, yoga instructors, mind body, people would all come together and collectively learn from world experts like yourself. Wow. And it sounds like wherever you've been in your professional life, you've always had this business 
um, side. Like you were kind of always looking for what was needed and then not just thinking about it, but actually doing it. Yeah, because the, the Fit Kid thing, I thought, well, you know, even if you create some videos and even now, if you do some things online, your audience is going to be limited to the people who see it. What I think in terms of exercise that works so well is to localize it. So we launched Fit Kids as a franchise. So we actually showed people how they could set up their own classes in their own community halls, how they could turn it into a business, how they could, you know, when I say a business, we're talking a localized business where you're running classes. So I'm not talking about opening a big gym just for, uh, for kids. Um, and we did very well. We had hundreds of Fit Kid um, coaches all around the UK who were doing it. And then some other countries of people I knew then launched it in Portugal and Spain and some other and some other places. So yeah, very much I've always been on that. How can you scale? But how can you scale in a way that I think when people in business, often they think about themselves, what are they going to get from it? I've always had this attitude and absolutely 100% from my mom. My mother is the kindest woman. Um, and she'll never watch or listen to this, hopefully. But my mother, if you ever listen to her accent, she is Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh. Her accent is literally Mrs. Doubtfire, so uh. it, she'd probably kill me if she heard me say that uh, say that out loud. But she's a lovely, kind woman. So I've always gone on the premise that if I can do something for someone else, they'll do something for us. And in business, that's what we try to encourage all of these coaches: is okay, what are you going to do for your local community? Go do a free class at the school. Go do something in you know uh, something where kids have got are underprivileged, etc. And then what they'll do is your core business that'll support your core uh, your core business how people feel how feel about you so that's always been my commercial thing is that business needs to be a two-way street I love that H how did you get business sense did you just have it like street smarts or did you have a mentor besides your mom showing kindness do you have a mentor yeah so or, this, yeah, yeah I mean actually I do have I have there's a there's a very uh, awesome gentleman I'm very lucky in two things is that there's an awesome gentleman in the UK called Tony Reeves who is a long-term entrepreneur, been very successful in education and training. And um, he's actually one of the um, chairmen of Chelsea Football Club. Um, and I've done a couple of businesses um, with him. I was the CEO of a company and he, he has mentored me. He's, 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 you know, he's well into his seventies, if not 80 now, still works every day. Just, he has this attitude of just a kind, generous, uh, generous man with a bit of an edge. And yeah, he's, he's been my mentor. I'm also, a little bit lucky in that um, I also, um, with him, we part own a sports agency, and you're going to laugh when I tell you this, but um, with Elton John. Um, so I'm not um, going to laugh at that. I'm jealous. Oh. Yeah, so Elton, people don't realize that Elton has always been a massive tennis fan, but he also used to own Watford, who were a uh, premiership soccer club. And he has his rocket music. He has his rocket film, but he also has rocket sports. And we get to... to to kind of work aside him. Well, his overall manager is a guy called Luke Lloyd Davies. Um, and also Luke is somebody I kind of look up to and admire um, how he crosses all sorts of uh, all sorts of different um, different businesses. Um, and he's just another one of these kind people who likes to do things for each other. Nothing's any trouble. And mm -hmm. I, I give anybody who's listening to this, I give you a tip in this world now. If you want to know somebody who you should mentor, if you call them and they pick up the phone and they don't just text you back, they are somebody who you want to support you. The old school way of answering the phone, picking it up, responding quickly is something that the world needs to get back to. This waiting three hours to send a text or communicate that way, that's an insecurity in my opinion in yourself. Um, answer the phone, respond to people, you know, and even if it's no, totally fine, even if you don't agree with them respond to them. And that's, a, that's another big tip that I've found has worked very well for me in business. I, 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 I just want to absolutely echo that because I know when I go, um, and you're so great about this, when we communicate, you're always right back. You say you're going to do something, you do it immediately. And it is something that is subtle, but so powerful. And I, I do, I notice it. And I don't want to say I notice it because it's lacking everywhere else, but maybe that's the case. But I, I think we notice those things because we're being seen and we're being heard and it takes so little, but it is such a, it's up leveling your professional um, sense. And so I try my best to write back to people on Instagram that write me a question and they're always stunned that I write back. And I think, where have we gone that this is a surprise? Yeah. Like you're asking me a question, I'm a regular person, 
you've taken the time to write me, I should at least attempt to write you back. That seems like common courtesy, but you're right. That is just because of the, I guess, hurriedness and the fast tracking of, of our lives. We, we forget about this very fundamental thing, which is human communication at its best. Yeah, there's, there's actually, um, and I admire her, there's a lady called Dr. Jen Esquire, who has I know, got, do you know yeah, Jen? I know Jen very well. Yeah, yeah she's well, been on my well, podcast she, a couple of times. So Jen she's a Dom. really good example of yep. somebody who does things well. Um, she'll respond instantly, but she's got a big audience. Obviously, she gets a lot of communication. And I just watch the way that she responds to people, how she communicates with people, et cetera. She's somebody for people to admire and follow the way that she does business. And then, of course, her content is uh, her content Amazing. is exceptional. Yeah. Oh, she's wonderful. And I, I think she also has that just ingrained. I, I think it's like a human decency at its at its base level. Like Her husband's that's, awesome, too. He's, he's Oh, a, yeah. Oh, awesome. I love them. They're wonderful. And they, yeah. you're right. They're great examples of um, doing this for service. Of course, they have a business behind it. But at the end of the day, they're answering lots of questions. And I'm sure a lot of those people aren't signing up for stuff. And that's just because that's what they believe in, they're passionate about. And they and in human connection is, is a big part of our fitness business. I mean, we rely Absolutely. on others. What are some other attributes you would say um, that you see that make a successful entrepreneur? Because I know a lot of people who are listening um, might not even think of themselves as an entrepreneur, might not think that they would even be able to start something. But how would you say, what are some characteristic traits that are very yeah, important I, to have? You know, we're in this world, uh, and I, I always get the wrong terms here, but you're in this world of advocacy versus influence versus education. And I hear a lot of people who criticize people who are supposedly called this thing called an influencer. It's almost like it's become a negative, a negative term. And then you've got the Dr. Jens of this world, et cetera, who are, you know, wonderful advocates. I think authenticity is one of the things is that if you're going to promote a product and whether you're paid or not, um, you've got to be authentic and you've got to really do it because you believe in it. I mean, I, I don't actually work with that many different brands or companies, even though I get offered to support it throughout. I mean, we have, uh, through our business, we've got a significant professional network now. We reach millions of people through thousands of professionals. That's the thing that we've built. I've always been into working in the professional B2B world. Um, and the ones that we've got on there that have been super successful, the ones who are just truly advocates, they believe in what they're saying. It's that you're better to turn down the money um, than to take some finance just to promote any old any old product. And the ones who are really successful online, whether you want to call them an influencer, an advocate, an ambassador, whatever you want to call them, they're authentic. Um, so just be authentic um, and link that to the, what we said earlier, respond well, be kind to people. I always think the people who are the ones that don't answer, the ones that think they've got all these great followers, et cetera, they've got an insecurity themselves. It's like they want to feel powerful from all that sort they of thing. They want to stay like and a curtain between them, right? Stay a curtain like, between yeah. them because it makes them feel like they're a Hollywood star or whatever. And you don't need to do that at all. You really don't uh, need to do that. Amen. I totally agree. And I think that for a lot of people, if you didn't like hear what Andy was saying, I think what I hear from people who come to me is they're very interested in this kind of in game. And I think if you're guided by um, like what you're going to get out of it, it just goes back to what you're saying about your mom, you are losing out on that entrepreneurial spirit and on that um, passion and that drive. I think it's so much better to take one step at a time and like really be present in that moment and not be driven by some kind of accolade or money or what, in, whatever it is. I think, again, that goes back to that sense of authenticity. If you're doing it because you're passionate, you're showing up every day because of that, not because of some like, you know, award at the end of it all. I mean, obviously we want to be successful and there are tangible ways that we measure that, but I'm curious, what do you define as success? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. If you asked me that question 30 years ago, I would have said to you, money. Nice I know house, when we're older, we nice have a different car, approach, right? <laughs> like all of the, yeah, I would have said all of those, um, all of those things. And I, absolutely. I'm, I'm 
I am super competitive. I like to I like to win. I still get that buzz from that little sale, whether it's a one dollar product or a twenty thousand dollar product. I get the same still buzz from that. I am a bit of a sales guy in terms of. I think any entrepreneur needs to understand that being a sales guy is an attribute. That's not a negative. People often get worried about you. You know, they'll say he's just trying to sell you. Correct. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to actually sell something that might help your business, that might actually help you. And, and that's the bit that poor salespeople don't get. They always think about what's in it for me, what's in it for us. They don't think about the other way. What am I, what am I doing? And I think you know that one of the projects that we have launched through our professional ambassadors network is we've launched this product called Curate, Curate Goods. And it's designed and it came out of support um, from other professionals who then just said, Andy, we don't have the time to do this. Could you help us with this? And um, my business partner, Lauren, and I just thought, okay, what is it that's going to help these professionals? And these professionals are chiropractors, physical therapists, people like yourself, mind body instructors, strength and conditioning coaches, um, just there any type of professional that's in that way. They often need other products and services that will support the clients to get the results. But they're so busy doing the day to day stuff for the clients, they can't organize good products to then do it. So that's all we've done with Create Goods. We've gone and found products that really do two things. They've got to be good for the planet and they have to do what they say on the tin. So if they say they're going to improve your skin or if they say that they're going to strengthen your bones or if they say that they're going to give you more energy, we absolutely, we make sure that we check the science on it. We make sure that most of the time we get it right, not always, but we make sure that something that we're promoting to this professional community is going to be valued. So then if they then become an advocate of that, they can trust that that's done. And that's why we called it Curate. We're curating products from all around the world. And the other bit that we're really into is that it's just got to be good for the planet. If they're being created in a way that's chucking a load of CO2 into the air, we're just not interested. So that is probably a lot of due diligence of, of researching not only the efficacy of these products, but also like how they're manufactured, how the employees are treated, how green is the packaging, et cetera. That, that, do you have a team that does that or are you involved? Yeah, we've got the several, so, you know, but there's actually, again, if you want to, to be able to judge it quickly, talk to the founder. Hmm. Usually the way the founder behaves or the head person behaves will let you kind of know, you'll get this kind of, I get this gut feel very quickly as to how they do and, and curate as a series of brands and products that are on there. And every single one of the founders we've got on there are some of the most likable people in the world. They really care about the brand, the product, the, their efficacy is great. Um, like all of us, they make mistakes. We make mistakes. Sometimes they don't get it 100% right. But, you know, we've got a product on there, which is uh, a series of collagen based and vegan i know you're vegan there's a bunch mm -hmm. of vegan different blends on there and the founder of that she just said i'm not using any plastic so all of it is in glass bottles because it makes it easy to recycle as soon as i heard that from that founder not only did i get excited to put it on curate i actually invested in her company um, as well because i thought ah she just cares about the planet because she's just thinking through not just what the ingredients are she's thinking through about the packaging and everything um, i i like that about um, about founders I do too. And I'm curious when you, um, I'm imagining, you know, as most of us 20 years ago, recycling, environmental um, concerns were just a, a lesser priority. They just didn't have the, um, the kind of uh, emergent quality that it has now. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you first became really interested in having all of your different businesses be involved in more environmentally sustainable practices. Yeah, I, I, I get, you were asking me earlier about mentors. Probably one of my favorite people that I get to work with is a guy called Galahad Clark. And the surname is the clue. So he is uh, from Clark's footwear. They've been making footwear for 300 years. Um, very successful, based in the, in the UK. Him and uh, one of his um, family members, a guy called Asher Clark, launched a brand. It was a, uh, originally... Um, called Terra Plana, and then it became now a company called Vivo Barefoot. Um, and one of the things that they've always been into is um, not just the advocacy around using barefoot because it's better for you, you know, it's better for your feet, it's better for your balance, et cetera. But they were always about, let's look at the materials we're using. 
let's reduce our carbon footprint. And one of the things they started using, they started using biomaterials, they've used algae, they've used corn-based materials, all sorts of different biomaterials. Um, they're also very into recycling, and they've even got this program now called Revivo, where they take your footwear back, they repair it and resell it. And so, that, so I've always um, admired what they're doing, and Galahad's definitely somebody who's excited me about that world. Um, and the, the, the interesting thing about things like everyone gets excited about recycling and it's good, but the data just came out in the last week that in the world, only 8% of materials are recycled, total mm. materials. And the US just dropped to 5%. Now, when you consider that Japan is 85%, the US is a long, long way behind in terms of recycled materials. So there's a lot of opportunity there. So again, same thing. Any business that I want to get involved in, I'm going to look at what are you doing in terms of recycling? What are you doing in terms of using, you know, alternative plant-based materials, et cetera? Because there are a lot of great opportunities um, around that. And I'm lucky enough to work with some brands introducing them to plant-based materials, which you believe we're doing golf balls, American footballs, basketballs, yoga mats, barbells, dumbbells, all can be made from bio-based materials versus fossil fuel materials. That's so exciting. And I'm sure that really, when you get up in the morning, it's like, that's what really lights you up is that you're, you're in this um, entrepreneurial lane, which clearly uh, suits you, but you're also doing things that spark that passion and that mission. Yeah, I mean, you asked, you asked me, what is it that drives me now? And I, I was being honest with you, it was money. It was the big house. It was the car. Now you're right. It's, these are some of the things that um, that I'm very uh, passionate about. I've always been passionate about uh, kids' exercise and promoting them. Because I think the earlier you get them, the more likely to carry it on. Um, but I've also been very, always very passionate about how can you do things in a in a sustainable way that um, that benefits the planet. And again, everybody wants to everybody wants to criticize what people are doing. And I think you know, Let's not get into politics, please. Let's not get into it. But if you look at the way politics, you now all that happens is that people just criticize each other. They don't actually necessarily tell you what they're going to what they're going to do. And if you're going to be a successful entrepreneur, tell people what you believe in. Tell them what you're going to do. Actually, get out there and do it. Don't just sit there and criticize the competitors or your other your other. You know, I, right. I you come up with here, solutions. Give you Twenty reasons why the, some of the big footwear companies are not doing things as sustainable as they could. Or alternatively, I could promote all the companies that are doing great sustainable things. I, I prefer the latter. I absolutely agree. I, it's just like when I'm um, teaching and I'm teaching teachers, I always say, tell them what you want them to do versus what you don't want them to do. Sometimes that helps so that you can appreciate like this is a common misalignment that a lot of people do, but then really focus on what you want to do because that's we want the brain to hook into the things we want, the things we want to be doing. I always tell this um, story that my cousin was a professional race car driver and he'd ask a, another older race, um, Indy, Indy 500 driver. Indy 500, okay, wow, that's, yeah. that's impressive. Yes, it is. And I never really appreciated how freaking hard it is to be oh, in a car yeah. going that fast and like G-force and how G-force strong and you stuff. have to be. Yeah. yeah, and he was telling me I need more yoga and all this stuff, but he was... Um, a, a, an older car, a, an older driver um, giving advice said, you know, the best advice is don't look at the wall. And the idea is like, you don't want to look where you are fearful of going or where you don't want to go. You want to look where you want to go. So it's that same idea. Look at like highlight the people that are doing the good and, and highlight. Which yeah. The most, you know, I mean, if you think about a lot of kids nowadays, they have got a lot of insecurities. There's a lot of pressure with them with the online, et cetera. So any coaches, Anybody who's working in that sort of youth fitness or youth sports, I would say look, stick with the stick with the positive. You know, I have a I have a 25 year old son, and uh, same thing. There are times when I just want to give him positive reinforcement. He has his anxieties, he has issues like all you know, kids. But he, you know, he's doing remarkably well. He's he's moved from the UK now here to the US. He's got a great job, great friends, and he's doing great. But even then, he still needs that pep talk sometimes because there's so much pressure online about what you're not, um, but you're not doing well. And I think that's, that's really, really important. It's different times from what it, uh, what it used to be. It really is. So if you were to look at your life right now and, you know, the whatever, big house, big car, whatever you, the things you have, 
and you were having to eliminate, what is something that is absolutely dear to you that you will never let go of? Oh, I mean, obviously besides the wife, people, besides people, obviously my wife and family. Right. Oh yeah. Let's not let go of her. Besides yeah, people. Yeah. So, is there yeah, something family, that really is so meaningful that you're going to take with you? Yeah. I mean, really it's a, this is why I think this conversation is, is lovely is that it's leading a healthy, active lifestyle. I think I just, you know, a lot of my friends, uh, they're amazed at what I do. And, you know, you know, I, I still, the way I compete now, I don't try and play football or soccer anymore because uh, let me tell you a funny story, how stupid my competitiveness. So I went to Scotland last week to play golf. And one of the caddies that were there was a, a young 20 year old rugby coach. And as we went around, we were on Carnoustie, the famous golf course. And as we went around, we met another um, young kid who played rugby, who was, who was caddying too. And he said, oh yeah, I'm the fast one. Um, he's the coach, he's the slow one. And I went, oh, I used to be fast let's have a race on the golf course. So I'm slightly older than 20. The three of us line up. We see a marker about 50 yards away and we go for it. And my friend said, you're going to pull your hamstring. Sure enough, 30 yards down, <laughs> hamstring went. No went, way. Uh, went, like, uh, went like this. So I think in terms of that competitive spirit, I've still got that competitive spirit. Um, so now I just generally try to just not- Channel it, it. In, a, in a healthy way. Yeah, I think sometimes we, you know, it's like, our minds are still young. And I think that's what's great is there's that belief like, yeah, I can do that still. And then it's like, oh, wait, I, I've done that too with my son running on the beach, like, oh yeah, no problem. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, I'm not equipped for this. So speaking of health, I mean, you are going to be 60. And I can't believe this. Anybody who um, <laughs> might watch this or doesn't know, Andy looks like he could be turning. He just told me he had a big birthday. I thought he was turning 40. So what are some secrets to, or not so secrets, things that you want to share that have helped you and you really think are apply to the general, like top five well, you, tips you, for you, aging you, well. You do realize that all Scottish people look like this at 60. Oh yes, of course. I've seen them. <laughs> Unless they've been drinking a lot, right? You've seen, you've seen, you've seen Rod Stewart, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's 70. He still jumps around that stage. He actually, yeah, he does. He's incredible. Yeah, he still does that. No, I think that... I don't know if there's anyone's except I just think I think definitely leading a healthy active lifestyle is is key. Um, one of the things I like, I like data. So I, I previously was a CEO of a company where we had a wearable technology. Um, I've been another CEO of another company where we used ultrasound to measure all sorts of body measurements. So I think just understanding what goes on. And I like the collective. So I like to look every month. So I've just looked at my July figures now to July figures of 21, 2019, 20, 17. Overall, I, I use a polar heart rate, um, polar monitor and a polar watch to monitor it. Um, and then I really only look to see, did I do more activity this month than I did last year or last year, the year before? So even as I'm getting older, I'm not lessening it. I'm actually trying to push and do more. Um, I only measure, for me, I don't measure, my wife has got the Apple Watch. I don't like the whole daily activity and sleep and all that bit, that's not me. I just like to measure what I do in terms of exercise. But I'm really strict with it. I use the same settings. I turn it on and off in the same way, et cetera, so I can get a real, a real comparison. So I think just knowing what you're doing, because that can creep up in you. And I th you know, I had, I had two kids and I was driving an hour and a quarter into London every day. I put on 25, 30 pounds at that time, even though I was still exercising. So just knowing that collective data point is, is something. Um, I, th I think that's you know, really actually a really good point because most of us don't realize what we are or what we aren't doing unless we have some kind of tracker. Yeah. And um, if you're not somebody who, who likes all the devices, maybe write it down. Like just, and that's what I, I talk a lot about with accountability and with discipline and, and, and with just kind of, if you've been off track, like getting back on is you actually need some kind of um, data collection to, to market. Otherwise you can, yeah. you, don't know, you know, I think a lot of people get worried about, oh, I'm like 10% off what I did yesterday. I, I think the short term things, I think you should be more interested in the collective. What did you do every month? What did you do every quarter? What did you do every year? Look at that because so what if you take a couple of days off? So what if you, so a lot of people in our world, you know, can give themselves some health issues through pressurizing them. Same with diet. Is there any issue with counting calories? No. Um, is that okay if that's your thing to, to do that? You know, for example, I, I haven't eaten red meat since I was 17. I come from Scotland, an area where 
red meat is one of the core Aberdeen Angus beef is where I come where I come from. And the only reason I stopped eating uh, red meat is my dear mom and dad suddenly got some money. We started eating seafood and I preferred it. No health reason around it, et cetera. But that's one of the things I just, I don't do. I eat lots of fish and seafood, et cetera, around there. Um, but no magic thing. Do, do I take supplements? Yep, I do take supplements. I, I'm happy to say, you know, most guys are frank to say this. So I think, yeah, I do take collagen. Yes, I do take things for, I do put different creams and potions on my skin to try and look at my, uh, to look at my, um, you know, health of my skin, uh, et cetera. I have a daily routine that I do every day. Um, I actually intermittent fast every day. So I don't eat before um, 12 o'clock. That's been my thing now. I've done that for, for years. And I actually I did it originally for weight, for weight loss. Um, and now actually I find it really makes me have great clarity and focus in the morning. I'm similar and I there's a lot of different, that could be a whole other topic, but I don't, I'm not even, I've I'm not hungry in the morning. So I just started, I call it more intuition. Like I wasn't hungry. I just wanted water and coffee. And, and then, and I find that the days that if I were to be served something, um, I, yeah, I'm just not as crisp. Um, and that works. I think the thing is to figure out what works for you. And that some people could wake up and they would just be, they wouldn't be able to function if they didn't eat. But I think it's yeah. really important to kind of listen yeah, my to best friend here, my best yeah. friend here, he gets hungry. You know, yeah. we went to Scotland and the, the, you know, the one thing I, I was kind of, He'd never been to the UK before, never been to Scotland. And the first thing I made sure every day was that we knew where the food was coming. Um, mm -hmm. And then he had a great time to yeah. uh, do that. So different It's people important to know those people. <laughs> because, yeah, people or or know, like, the, like when you know those people, it's important to really keep track of it because there are people who are really affected by not getting food. Yeah, very much so. What else uh, in your daily life do you make, brings you joy? Um, oh, well, I mean... Sounds I like you're joyful America. anyway. But. I love America's Got Talent. Oh, I love it too. I don't get to watch it much except when they're featuring like, you know, a special person and then they show them and I get the chills and I cry every time. And my husband and I are like, look at this person. Yeah. The other, the other thing I'm, um, I'm very lucky that my, uh, my wife is um, half Korean um, descent. She is a terrific um, cook, terrific chef, whatever the right term is. Um, and she likes watching different cooking programs. And, and I actually, we really love watching that Beat Bobby Flay show. So I, I like, we it. like watching. I think yeah. at the end of the day, when you've worked really hard, she has a very high pressure job during the day. But you have that moment where you sit down and you have your little happy hour, whether it's alcohol or not, it doesn't really matter. You sit down there, you've got that moment where you spend that 45 minutes or an hour chatting, and then you sit down and do something that you like to do together. That's, I think that's also part of your health because your mind can affect a lot of, a lot of those, um, a lot of those things. And um, we have a dear dog, and you know, we listen to lots of other podcasts like Andrew Huberman, and you know, a whole bunch of different people. And I forget which podcast it was, but my wife picked up and said, you know, he suggests that you get out and you get some sunlight every morning. So that's generally what we both try and do. We try and get out, walk the dog early, early on, get the sunlight, etc. So there's there's all sorts of different things in that recipe of, of you know, feeling good, uh, feeling good about yourself. I try not to start the day by looking at emails or social media. Try not to. That's not always possible. Yeah, I know. Those, that's, those are great tips, Andy. And I mean, again, you uh, you look vibrant and healthy and young. And I, I think you said your wife, when we were talking ahead of time, also told you there was a podcast where it was about almost reverse age engineering. And I think this is something I've talked about for so long in terms of whether or not that's a real thing, but it's a lot of it is in our mental. We have been conditioned to believe at a certain point, we're just like on this downward spiral. I would have people in their mid forties tell me, well, I used to be able to do this, but now my knees, you know, I've got old knees. And I'm like, if you speak like that, you're going to believe it. And then you're just going to reinforce it. And then you're going to put more and more barriers. Yeah. Well, I, um, yeah. So I, as I said, I'm competitive. So I, I have a spin bike upstairs and I have a 20 minute, 10 mile, 45 minute and one hour challenge. And I constantly try to beat the distance and wattage that I do. I've never had higher scores than I've had in the last 12 months on, on there. So it is absolutely possible to push yourself and to improve things, et cetera. Uh, whether you're reversing aging or not, I, need, I haven't listened to the podcast yet. Um, I'm gonna listen to it. Um, there is no doubt that you can certainly improve at, at any age. You can yes. certainly improve. You do not need to think that age is going to creep up in you and uh, it's going to, yeah, 
I, you well, know, you're I, a great example of that. So do you wear your Vivo barefoot shoes? And can you also tell us some of your favorite products on your curate? Yeah, so uh, uh, Vivo barefoot is my passion. Um, I haven't worn other than at my wedding for 15 minutes where I wore some leather shoes. Uh, I haven't worn any other shoes for 15 years. Mm. Um, I, they're, they're great because they allow my, you know, my feet to spread. They're me stronger. They're just, uh, they're just the great materials, et cetera. So yeah, I wear them all the time. And then I, I'm, in terms of other products on Curate Goods, there are a bunch of different um, supplements. There. There's a whole vegan range. Uh, the CBD range is on there. Um, there are fitness products on there that can help your clients, et cetera. Um, and it's interesting. Not only did I hurt my hamstring, but I had a, before I went to golf, I had a little hamstring, I saw a little hip flexor issue. And I came across this product called a pain pod, which is like a TENS and a EMS machine that I put on. I didn't understand that technology. I didn't understand it. And, and what I like to do when I get a new product is I don't like anyone to tell me anything. Tell me the product like I'm a consumer. I need to read it myself or work it out. Wow, what a difference. And my friend who was playing golf, we got a lower back issue when he was playing golf. We put this machine on him. Um, he did it for 30 minutes. He was swinging great again the next day. So there's a whole bunch of different products on Curate Goods that are designed for professionals to advocate, but are also designed for um, just you know regular customers who've got a particular goal that they're looking for. That's the whole idea of it being curated. It's got some sort of performance benefit, whether it's rehab, performance, recovery, whatever it is. And then it's got the whole sustainability side. I love that. All right. Well, everybody's got to check that out. We'll have all the information in the show notes and you're giving a nice discount as well. And we're so grateful for that. Well, Andy, thank you. I've, I'm so happy that um, I met you a while back with Vivo and you're such an inspiration, not only just as a, a terrific entrepreneur, very successful, but also a human being. Thank you, mama. Thanks. She raised, she raised yeah. you well. <laughs> yeah, she did. Yeah, she did. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. Pleasure. And for everybody listening, as always, I'm pulling for you.